This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for therapy. If you are experiencing mental distress, please seek professional help. We are, we are, we are all symbol miracles. Welcome to the Wellness Project Podcast. I am your host, Wilson. Each episode aims to bring mental health awareness through exploring psychoeducation, scholarly literature, professional interviews, and the personal stories of people's journey to mental wellness. So, with that said, let's get started. So go home, go line your pockets with anything gold. And I've found it particularly useful yeah. uh, to control my breathing. It's it's interesting. Um, I've done the same thing with, um, you know, obviously my client's consent and I'm not recording them, but... I think there is something therapeutic about the auditory setup of having the headphones and, and, you know, and talking it into like the microphone. It's, I don't know, it's, it's a really unique space. Um, I did try to do a little bit of like scholarly research to see if anybody had actually studied this form of doing therapy and there isn't. So I'm, I'm kind of excited maybe down the road to, you know, do some kind of qualitative study where, um, I would probably need two different groups, you know, a group of just doing traditional talk therapy and then another group doing talk therapy, but purely through the audio of like podcasting equipment, Mm -hmm. you know, I just think that that would be so interesting. Um, like what has been your client's response to, to using it? Uh, well, I would, uh, I, I, I would just say just right off the bat, the convenience to be able to log in from from home or anywhere that they are is probably one of the most useful things for uh, for uh, for them. But I, I could also think on the various learning styles that um, that we have, I'm like thinking of some of us kind of activating more of our focus through the auditory uh sense mm-hmm. it, it, it is a great way to kind of get engaged and for myself i would say the auditory um does bring about a focus um where the let's say for example the kinesthetic moving around even using my hands mm-hmm. uh tends to activate more on the creative side so even on presentations or speaker engagements anything that i'm doing that I'm talking, I, I'll try to be very conscious of where my hands are going because mm. as soon as I see my right and my left hand can I just go over my head, yeah. I know that I'm going to be going on sound circle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for, for sure. Just, I mean, again, the the nonverbal, you know, body language and, and the way that you can improve that is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think so. I, I moved away from the microphone and realized that it's all good. <laughs> Maybe you can't hear me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so tell us a little bit about the work that you do, and uh, we'll just see where it flows from there. Uh, sure. So, um, I think that we can definitely tie it up uh, from uh, from from there. So, my name's Luis uh, Casada, and I am a development coach practitioner. Currently, what I do, I facilitate a process, um, collaborative process with professionals uh, to bring about new skills uh, to help develop uh, personal professional growth, uh, to dive into deeper uh, and newfound, perhaps, self-awareness. And of course, the purpose through this is to be able to build a new resilience, capacity, courage, uh, maybe even a mindset shift, uh, whatever the case may, may, may be, anything that we kind of kind of get stuck from uh, from time to time. And um, what led me to to this, um, definitely the passion to to the work. Um, it, 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 once uh, I started getting engaged in uh, coaching relationships uh, and 
thinking of coaching skills in the way that I would carry both uh, conversations personally and professionally, um, I realized that there is a deeper way that we can really get in tune when we're talking with uh, with someone. So I'm very passionate about what, what I what, yeah. what I do. No, 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 absolutely. It it, it sort of sounds like a mental tune up. Um, you know the the idea of of, of promoting personal growth, professional growth. I mean, uh, hopefully like for, for the audience that, that passion to do that never, never stops. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I think that we should, um, we should always think about, uh, personal growth, uh, or personal growth just in, in, in general. I think that ties, ties in directly with professional growth, whatever, whatever we do in our personal lives impacts our professional lives and and vice versa. Oh yeah. So, so by nature of working on one or the other, you're technically kind of tackling the the same thing. And the fact is, is that it, it never stops. Um, we still have the opportunity to every day in and out have the opportunity to to find that growth, to find that that motivates us. Um, you know what? One of the things I was uh, talking to 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 my partner, a couple of friends about. Um, about living your best life. And I hear that so so often. Oh, I want to be able to live my best life. And, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, I can help you live your, your best life. And uh, sometimes when I'm talking about coaching and, and um, the the direct uh, typical assumption is uh, life coaching because that's, that's just generally what we are kind of uh, more aware of about the, the profession itself. But I, I, I was uh, talking to my friends about this and, and I'm like, well, it's not so much so necessarily that I'm, I'm helping people live their best lives because mm. they already are. I mean, th this morning when they woke up to open up their eyes and make right. the decision to start moving, you are at that point living your best life, right? But how do you make the best out of it too? Yeah, I mean, um, what's the quote? You can always better your best. You know, I... I, I, I in my line of work, it's, I mean, I'm sure it's probably across the board, but this like perfectionism, you know, get, getting everything perfect. It's just, it is a horrible mindset. I think it's, it's a, so much more toxic than what people think that, you know, you can, you can think about this in many aspects of your life. And I just don't see how getting it perfect is beneficial. You know, there's just so much let down that proceeds with trying to chase that idea. Does that yeah. make sense? You know, it, it, it just, just do the best that you can do and work on bettering your best. That's a much more fulfilling, I think, process to, to getting the most out of life than let's get it perfect. You know, I, everything has to be perfect, mm -hmm. you know, ugh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that it would uh, be setting up the bar somewhere and wherever that somewhere is, it's already pre-decided and expected that that's where the bar is. Uh, so yeah. what is the ambition right after after that? And then second is the um, idea also that it, it, when we think about this, we're thinking about the present moment and where we are at that perhaps tomorrow, a week, uh, two months, maybe a year from now, that bar is going to look completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of self expectation can very well drag into a self sabotage, if, if, if you may. I really like what you said on uh, one of the previous uh, podcasts, kind of like fail your way to success, because I mean, I think that it's truly that uh, piece of it. And kind of just reflecting uh, back through 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 my life and, and um, Thinking of of those moments that I I experienced uh, challenge that I experienced uh, turmoil through through my life. I mean, I can I can see where those moments occurred, and how quicker um, I'm able to bounce back from from those. Um, not aiming exactly at at perfection, but aiming at I can get up again and I can I can keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know I mean like if, if you would take a big life uh i don't want to say changing event but like your wedding day right i mean i'm sure you know everyone would want their wedding day to be perfect but when you're in that mindset you're not being present and you're not in the moment and regardless of what occurred during the wedding i think most people at the end of the night say man you know it was perfect you know it was it was just the the, the best experience i could have had Hopefully, though, it's because you were in the moment and you were being present. And I don't know that you could necessarily do both. Like, 
try to chase perfectionism and be in the moment, ugh, I mean, you know, that's just, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's uh, some really great uh, literature on, on, on this. And I think that the way that uh, I, I, I cannot remember his last name, Dr. Uh, it, it's a very long last name that I would not even be able to, to, to <laughs> pronounce, but he uh, talks about flow and how flow is generated. And, and I think that uh, part of the conversation there is exactly that, that in flow, um, which is presence, you are not uh, aiming for a perfection. You're aiming for where does scale match challenge mm. um, in order to develop more of that skill and still be able to maintain um, that motivation to continue trying it out. Maybe uh, playing a guitar uh, or an instrument is typically one of the best examples how you kind of like keep doing it and uh, little by little you start kind of learning it and then there's a moment uh, in that learning process that, oh, I'm playing the song. And in that very moment, I'm thinking, oh, I'm, oh, oh, I'm trying to remember what is the chord that goes next. And if I don't get it right, I'm going to mess up the song. And you do, you mess up the song because you've pulled yourself out of that flow, out of that instance and present moment. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. That's definitely cool. I'll share. I'll share with uh, with uh, with you, and um, maybe I, uh, once uh, you share also this this podcast, I'll I'll make sure to uh, come back and uh, tag the uh, name of the 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 the, the doctor. Oh, that, sure, that, sure. Uh, that that, that yeah. put this put this uh, forth, and I'm gonna say that that for myself personally. I mean, to to me to even conceive this sort of conversations. Um, it's not so much something that I would really ponder for uh, for for myself in a in the sense of trying to understand how I can be able to maintain both personally uh, my well being while also utilizing the same uh, line of thinking to be able to help others uh, to also pursue what is that drives them to do what they do. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And um, I think I found the doctor and you're right. There's no way I could <laughs> pronounce this name. It, Let's try it out. Does it start with a C? Yes. Oh my gosh. Here, here. I'll, I'll let you try. Cause I, that's one thing that <laughs> uh, pronunciations and names is like never like my thing, <laughs> which is kind of ironic that I, um, I enjoy doing podcasting, but well, uh, and, and I'm going to say that I, I'm probably not going to pronounce it right, but um, the first name is Mihaly, M-I-H-A-L-Y. I think that if you get that part right, you'll probably instantly mm -hmm. just once as soon as you Google that, but to sense Mihaly or something. Wow. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard pronunciation. Oh, I, on, on I'm pretty that. sure it's like 14 letters long. <laughs> I mean, like the guy's name. Oh boy. Let's just call him Dr. C. Dr. C. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Dr. C. Dr. Flo. Um, and he, um, he did interviews around the world. Um, and of course, just, uh, tapping into, um, everyone that uh, gets into that moment of flow, whether it be an artist, um, he interviewed, um, motorcycle gangs in in japan of what it was like for them to hop on that motorcycle and kind of just go around town and what got them into just be present and there and in the moment and what he found out then was um that there were some characteristics that permitted for people to to get into that zone mm. that we typically uh kind of kind of identify with that's cool yeah i, I mean when i'm doing my artwork, you know, I, I'd say like last night, you know, I get into just a, a, a very calming head space. Um, and again, I'm, I'm just sitting in my garage with, you know, a little bit of paint and a tiny brush and just kind of focusing all of my f attention on that one activity, you know, and I, I, I love doing it. You know, it's, it's, uh, I, I had an interesting conversation with a buddy last night, um, just about, you know, it's, it's so much more to me than the end product, you know, of, of, of producing the artwork. Um, and I think that that's important for an artist to, to find that flow. You know, I, I don't do it to make millions of dollars. It would be nice. I mean, let's be real, but it's, j it's literally each piece of the artwork is, is time, my energy, my focus my ability to be present 
and I love it. You know, like that's why I do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for sharing on, um, your personal experience on, um, doing art. And I think that it ties in very well when we think about the process, um, itself and, um, the, uh, what arises from the process, not that end product. Um, and I think that, um, early in, uh, ancient philosophy, uh, looking into stoicism, one of the things that we would be talking about, um, is the, uh, if you want to be an artist, paint if you want to be a musician then start playing an instrument so it's about what you are wanting to do and how do you go about that process to 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 get into into it uh, of course the end goal after after that um can just vary and the purpose or the fulfillment that it brings about um can be just so subjective um that it brings back uh that time that was dedicated to arts and mm. Yeah. So like what I hear you saying is, is essentially you, you have to get started. Like you have to do it. You have to be in the flow of it before you can produce it. Um, you know, there's, there's, and there's so many things that I wish I could do. There's things that I wish that I had the opportunity to do, but at the end of the day, the, the, the real mental block is not doing it. <laughs> you know, um, exactly it. yeah. And it, it was funny. Cause I, I was showing my buddy last night, the, like the very first time I ever tried to do my epoxy paintings, you know, the, the, the very first pour and I keep that little piece of artwork. Um, I dated it. It's January 14th of 2021, I think. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, <laughs> It looks like shit, <laughs> you know, it doesn't look very good at all, but I, I keep it for myself because I love looking at something new that I've created, you know, now that it's 20, 2024 and to do like a little comparison, you know, to go back and forth. And again, that's that, that process, that, that idea of getting started and, um, to kind of, I don't know, interweave to what we're talking about perfection. That's another illustration of it. Like I said, the first painting looked like crap. It wasn't very good at all, but I, it's probably one of the, my most prized possessions now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's worthless, to, to, you know, from, from like a monetary standpoint, but from an intellectual an emotional, a spiritual, a mental, um, it's, it's, it's all of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think uh, and thank you for bringing that up and and I I mean I I just sitting here uh, in your studio today uh, I mean I I see the uh, amount of art uh, uh, amazing art I mean I, I, every time I I, I uh, have the short opportunity I think this is the first time that we actually have a chance to to talk a little more in 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 depth but um, and there is so much value into into this um, and and if we are using it also as a as a metaphor right of kind of like when where did I get started. And where I am now, when we have uh, this that is so tangible that we can see and hold on our hands, it is very real. But I think that sometimes us as human beings, when we think about our personal trajectory of where life is leading us to, it's not something that we have so readily available to be able to to look back at and be able to observe and even make those comparisons kind of like have the the newer louise and the older louise and compare mm. the two of those uh and what changes have occurred of course now talking about it i i, I kind of kind of those start bubbling up throughout oh. my mind but um i, I think it's a, a great metaphor in a way to to uh also be able to to view kind of tying in a little bit of what we're talking about with um that personal and professional uh, growth. Yeah. And uh, I think, and this is kind of funny. Um, so my wife and I were having a conversation kind of about this over dinner a couple, a couple of nights ago where like, have, have you ever had the experience where you look back at an old photo of you and you, it, you know, you sort of think to yourself, oh man, you know, I was, I was so much better looking then, or, you know, man, like I was so much thinner then. And I, I, I asked my wife and sort of challenged her to say, yeah, but what did you think about yourself back then? Did you think that you looked better back then? Did you think that you were thinner back then? And she's like, no, of course not. I thought I was 
you know, ugly or, you know, heavier or, you know, whatever that negative thing is. And that's that, that that's that mental mindset that we're, we're talking about of you, that's what needs to change. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you, 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 if, if you had thought that you looked better back then, or that, you know, you, you had everything back then, then why don't you think that now, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And, and particularly, you know, I, I think we all look back on our old photos of, you know, of ourselves in high school and we're like, oh, you know, we had everything together. I call BS on that because mentally back then you didn't know anything. (laughs) You felt, you know, your sense of self-worth was in the trash can back then too. It's only now that you've looked back and you can reflect and say, I actually went somewhere in my life. You know, I, I, I love the idea of opening and closing chapters in my life. And it's, it's a way that I keep myself sane to know, I mean, I'll be honest, I've written some good chapters, but my best chapter hasn't even, hasn't even been written yet. And that's, it, it's inspiring to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with, um, I completely agree with, uh, with, with you. Uh, I, I, I think that, um, again, when we were talking about that presence and being in the, in the moment. Um, even reflecting back on on some of those instances, I I, I can always think of uh, either we're thinking too much about the past, we're thinking too much about the future, and uh, we're not living in the in the present. Mm-hmm. Um, and and for myself, I'm I'm going to be also honest on 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 this on this one too, um, Michael. That I'm going to say that for myself throughout my high school years and kind of after grad graduation and. Kind of like going through just life in general, I can, I can definitely um, resonate with uh, with with that. That my mind was either in the past or or, or in the future. I wasn't so much uh, in the present moment. Mm. Yeah, it's it's you know, and it's there's nothing wrong with that. I'm saying because I I think it's healthy to you know, to go through that change, probably realistically, that should happen around your late teens, early twenties, where, you know, you've had either a great childhood or maybe a not so great childhood. That's kind of shaped, you know, where, where your headspace is, but you have an opportunity then to start over, you know, and, or to have new experiences. Maybe your childhood wasn't that great, but now you can interact with other people that, that have had better childhoods or, you know, you, you sort of step out onto your own, but then at least for me, like the world was just spinning so slow. It was just so slow. And I was like, why can't I get here? You know? And then you inevitably, it's like you hit that wall where you're like, I am nowhere in my life where I thought I should be. And, and that's, that's a downer, but it's like, no, you haven't lived. Like you haven't given yourself the opportunity to experience things. I think for a lot of 20 some things, you know, they're like, I'm supposed to be making six figures. I'm supposed to be the boss. I'm supposed to have this big house. It's like, you got to live in a shithole first. you know, like you gotta, you gotta make minimum wage first. You gotta be able to kind of experience that because for me, you know, about to be 40, I appreciate those things now. You know, I, 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 I love my house. I, I love my office. It's, it's, a it's a love of where I've been and, and to feel gratitude for now having it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you get that if you don't have the other side of it. Yeah, it, that is, um, an interesting, um, uh, an, an interesting notion um, because he would also speak about um, having to experience um, a, a, a form of uh, suffering or uh, a form of not having the things that you would want to be able to to have in order to be able to appreciate the the contrary. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and and I. I, I Something very relevant um, here also, uh, Michael, when you're talking about closing that chapter, uh, one of the things is that it does bring about the perception of choice. Uh, This is where I want to close this chapter. And I I have that choice to be able to close that chapter and kind of 
move forward. Um, mm. However, it ends that chapter. I mean, it's your book, so you technically can close it the, the way that you want to close it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I relate very much with that with you, and and I'm gonna say that we're we're along the same age because uh, it didn't hit to me the gratitude that I have about life and the things that I have today until this stage and point in my in my life. Mm. And of course, I mean, I, I think naturally for anyone, the thought is, well, I wish I could think like this when I was that age. But it, it, is it truly that I would have thought about this in that age that would have allowed me to have that perception? Or as you're saying, me having to endure through what life was throwing at me permitted me to be able to say, I wish I could have known that then, um, because now I can also accept it, uh, and 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 there is a sense of letting go, a sense of I closed that chapter, a sense of I can restart it. Yeah, no, no, I, absolutely. It's I, I think that it's a it's a mind trick. It's a it's a false belief that you could have or should have had that foresight you know what i mean and i mean i i I really i think it can illustrate that mostly through my relationships it's it's not that i haven't had some bad relationships in my life or you know whether it was my fault or the other person's fault but i think because i've gone through those bad relationships with people not necessarily even just intimate ones but just with you know navigating my social reality that I have now gained a better appreciation for the good people I do have in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 like my, my, my relationship with my wife is the best it's ever been. And it's the best it's ever going to be each day that I'm with her. You know, it's, it, and, and I, I value that because I've had heartache, you know, I've, I've, I've hurt people's feelings people have hurt my feelings. So there's this, I think this, you know, running through the mud of it, you know, because I think relationships are, are, are tricky, you know, they're, they're extremely time consuming to navigate. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is like, you kind of just get thrown into them, you know, like you don't get to pick your parents, you don't get to pick your, your most influential childhood experiences because of the school district that you just happen to be placed in. And if, if you, if you keep, how do I say this? If you stay in that same chapter of your life and you keep trying to erase it and to just add more paragraphs to it, man, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how people can, can, can stay in that. It's like, close that chapter, just start a new one, you know, take it's, it's fun for me to work with people and to help them sort of realize what tragedy has, has, has maybe taught them, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to kind of gain that insight to then say, you know what, this is what I don't want in my next relationship. You know, this is now, now that I'm wiser, I'm, I'm smarter, I'm, I'm more in tune with what I want out of a relationship. Now I can go and find that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Th- thank you for, uh, for, for sharing. Um, that uh, Michael, I, th- I think that um, that's exactly where we're where we're at, um, and in this point in in time, right, um, closed out that that chapter and 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 moving moving forward. Um, I'm I'm gonna say for um, for myself through through that process um, has been exactly exactly it, and I also want to maybe just point out here. Uh, just briefly, and kind of like uh, maybe if, uh, some of the the people that are listening in um, as well, and kind of just looking back and kind of like thinking of, oh, you know what, geez, I really haven't had any of those kind of hardships or difficult uh, times that kind of pushed me into that direction. But I also want to say that there is this notion also that there is it doesn't have to be something huge or big. It, it, it can also be some of those small small things that inconvenience uh, you and you just are okay with those small things that inconvenience you. And every day you can look for those things that are going to inconvenience you a little bit and you push yourself through 
through those, uh, taking out the trash. This is right now, I'm going to go take out the trash. Uh, maybe I should do it later because I don't feel like putting on my big jacket. It's cold outside. It's windy. I'm just going to inconvenience myself of just doing it right now, right? So it, it is also about um, there's those uh, little small opportunities that cannot happen through throughout. I think that people practice those even um, in in religion. Stop eating uh, is a little bit of an inconvenience to I don't eat and I know all my mental uh, being will not be completely there because I'm kind of hungry, but I'm inconveniencing myself for something different. So there's also those small instances that that do occur. I, I do, of course, have to acknowledge that through all the unique lived experiences that people go through, um, all of those are unique in their way and they kind of bring about something that uplifts that person individually. Yeah. Yeah, there, it does seem like there's... I don't know. I, and, and again, I'm, I'm giving this like a very broad stroke of, of, you know, thinking that people just need to challenge themselves more. I don't know. You know, it's like, I just want to stay in this little box and not take the risk and potentially get hurt. Um, I don't want to exert the energy, you know, and it's like, no, 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 you need to do that. Like <laughs> you, you, it's one of the things that I, I, for some reason, keep going back and doing public speaking. I hate it sometimes, not, not, not doing the public speaking. I hate the time before, you know, like as soon as I sign up to do an event, it's like the mental clock starts and my stomach is in knots, you know, and, and I'm like, why do I do this to myself? But then when the day comes, you know, I mean, this, this anxiety is just boiling over in my guts. And then the second I say, you know, thank you for having me, you know, I feel amazing. I feel like, wow, I got, I got through it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can, um, I can easily see how sometimes that can even um, become our own mental barrier uh, where procrastination um, either occurs because it is a very challenging topic, which this is not the case from what I'm hearing. It's more of the anticipation of how things will look like right there and then in the moment. And I can see how sometimes kind of like that even drags for us to even get started in, 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 in doing it. And sometimes even the thought might be that, oh, maybe, maybe, um, maybe I won't be too, too, too good at it. Um, but it could very well be that the anticipation or the anticipatory into that um, moment of being in front of people and the expectation that's going to come out from that is what is uh, uh, stalling that 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 process. Um, where sometimes in in our thinking we might be uh, headed more on the side of maybe, maybe it's on the uh, maybe I'm not too well equipped with my knowledge. Maybe I'm not the topic expert on what I'm talking about or whatever the the case may be. Right. So there's so many different um, things that can can have a play into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one of the topics that you were you were interested in too is this this idea of psychological safety you know and and that's maybe this isn't exactly a good kind of pairing to what we're talking about in that sense but yes you want to protect yourself psychologically but i i think you also need to flex that side of yourself you know when i'm talking with people about ptsd you know the the fight flight or freeze way of thinking of things that's that's ingrained into our brains that's not going to go away it's it's not that that part is damaged it's that it was exercised beyond what it was intended for right you know there are times in all of our lives that we need to fight we might need to freeze you know we might need to flee absolutely but for people that have experienced ptsd it, it's it's almost as if those are the only three options and they're all in heightened um, responses to just, you know, everyday life. So it's, it's working with people to get them to not diminish or to get rid of your fight, flight, or freeze, uh, you know, parts of you. It, it's to go back, you know, reassess them, uh, flex them in safe ways. You know, I mean, I think we all would agree that if, we're, in, you know, we're walking down the street and, you know, guns are firing off and fires, you know, it's, it's crazy that you need to flee. Like you need to get out of there. That is a appropriate response. Mm -hmm. 
But if because of maybe past trauma that, you know, you now have this uh, phobia of large crowds of people or that it's difficult for you to go to the grocery store because of large, cr- large crowds of people, that that's something that you should work on. You know, it's, it's not going to be beneficial for you to avoid large crowds of people, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two two uh two interesting notions. Um, if I may, please please add in. In uh, I know um, we bring up the uh, portion on the topic of psychological safety. I, I like to um, also go a little bit into into depth um, into into that. Um, but I think that when um, initially when I started getting into what is psychological safety and how do we foster about psychological safety. I started thinking it in the sense of the workplace environment, but very well, I think that its applicability can go beyond beyond that, um, can go very well in this conversation that we are having. And even people listening in might even be an opportunity to kind of assess on what um, is it that we are both feeling accountable to um, and the expectations that we have to ourselves, but the other piece of it is the um, so the social uh, system in which we um, also um, operate. So there's uh, both that uh, right that belief that there is the self uh, regard, and on the other side we would have what is the social regard. What are the expectations that we also have about others, and how others will give us the opportunity to be accountable, to give us the opportunity to really show up. Um, so that's a little bit of that, uh, a bit of that um, uh, conversation. So let me then um, dive a little bit into, into psychological safety and maybe just to uh, do a quick overview of uh, this topic itself. Um, we are tying in portions of what we're already talking about, uh, psychological safety and the intersect that occurs with emotional intelligence and the intersects that occurs with presence, which we're uh, talking uh, at, the, at the start. Um, maybe just to give a little bit of the context of how I got into, into this topic more precisely. And um, I'm gonna say that this is also something that is relatively new. Um, even in the way that I'm mashing up all those three together, um, it's something that I've only seen maybe two or three different people kind of talk about um, throughout uh, leader fa- le- uh, leadership factor. Uh, Timothy, uh, Timothy Clark is one of the ones that talks about that intersectionality as well as um, uh, John, uh, no, uh, M- M- McCann, um, uh, it's his last name, I can't remember his, uh, Derek, uh, okay. Derek McCann, he also brings about this topic on how can we tie in those together. But um, again, I, I digress. So what got me into into it, um, uh, Michael, was um, early from my uh, career, uh, I, I, I started on the side of uh, mental health um, and Early in my career, I was working with the our local mental health authority in El Paso, Texas, um, as uh, through part of the uh, crisis and emergency services. So my job would basically entail uh, providing lethality assessment. Mm-hmm. Uh, my shift looked like seven p.m. to seven a.m. the oh. hour shifts, mm-hmm. and I was on call typically the next day. And of course, that's not something that has changed today. Uh, staffing occurs and I would be called in. And next thing I know, I'm working 16 hours uh, or more straight. Um, on an average, uh, perhaps I was doing somewhere between 70 to 80 assessments uh, per, per month. And about 70 to 80% of those assessments um, either were a suicide attempt, a suicidal ideation, um, and the rest of those assessments, maybe uh, uh, responding to a psychosis. So I would do most of those assessments at the at the ER, at the, the hospitals. That's just myself. That was um, 80, 70 uh, clients that I would see a month, right? And it was about 10 uh, crisis specialists. Yeah. So that always brought a lot of into that perspective. But while that was occurring um, and the compassion fatigue that I was experiencing through this line of work, I was also uh, managing through my own personal 
drinking habits and my own personal mental health at the same time. And on top of that, I was also managing through a relatively difficult place to work at where speaking up was not something that was um, expected, where asking questions was not something that you should be doing, where you showed up, you did what you were supposed to do and you went home. So mm. talking about, hey, we should maybe be switching a little bit on this process so that we can get this person quicker to admission or qu get him quicker to, to get home, or we should be leveraging maybe this uh, uh, kind of support uh, for, uh, for, for them. Um, so as my career uh, started uh, kind of just navigating through that. And I'm going to say that that for me was a big turmoil because I left with uh, that pace for about seven years until I reached a, a point of burnout. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't go on doing what I was doing. And something that I really loved, something that I really enjoyed talking to people um, about what occurred and how we could be able to provide the resources and the tools for them to get back into what they love about life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it was a little bit defeating in, um, through, through that. And as my career started uh, shifting a bit, um, when we moved up here to, uh, to Ohio, I had the wonderful uh, opportunity to lead on a program that uh, tackled through uh, multiple counties where we were uh, offering supports to, um, to employees um, and connecting them to various resources in the, in the community. In regards to like mental health, right? And uh, it, it, including mental health. Um, and, and, and thank you for bringing that up because in a lot of the conversations, mental health is something that intuitively is going to come up when we are talking about basic needs, when we're talking about I'm getting evicted, when I'm talking about I got my electricity shut off and it's freezing outside, when we're talking about they caught my hours and I don't know how I'm going to be paying for my car, which is the what takes me to work. Mm -hmm. I am stressed. I am feeling anxious about things. Um, I'm feeling sad about the situation. So typically it would also revolve a bit on how can we also build about uh, that self-efficacy um, or that self-determination to keep showing up to to work and doing the things that you do. But there, there was a constant conversation that goes into this. And the way that we were handling it is as a third party program that was supporting out those employees, it permitted a space where these conversations could occur, where people would feel comfortable to be able to talk. So uh, yeah. naturally for myself is maybe I'm bringing about a approach in my conversation that kind of builds that rapport and the relationship to open from, uh, from there. Mm -hmm. But the deeper that I start, started um, reading about it and me trying to understand, well, is it maybe the, the leadership style uh, that we're looking into, maybe the culture, is it perhaps the motivation? What exactly am I getting into? How can we, perhaps as a team, perhaps as a society, how can we foster an environment that people feel comfortable, that people feel that they can just talk out loud about these things that are becoming a challenge or that are a need or that uh, I just need a little bit of help, um, right? And uh, go ahead. No, yeah, no, no, no. And, and, and just, I mean, like as you're, as you're describing this though, it's, it's making me realize and I'm kind of, I can see both sides to it, you know, to, to your point. And I, I'm sure that what you were doing for work, you know, that experience of feeling burnt out and not having anyone to talk to about that, or, you know, to just shut up, put your head down, do your work, clock out. Yeah. That's not, that's not working people. You know, there, there has to be a safe place to sort of, and again, this is where I think, you know, therapy comes in, but like your human resources department is maybe not capable enough to, to handle the volume of, every employee just needing to, to, to talk, you know, and, and to sort of, 
you know, take care of their own mental health so that way they can be the best that they can be at their job. And what a, like, what a wonderful service, um, you know, to, to be a wellness coach or, or to have that, that wellness service available to your employees. That is a neutral party person, you know? Yeah. I can, I can sense and see that, you know, I wouldn't want to go to my boss and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling, you know, cause like that could be taken as, you know, you're not able to perform at your best at, at your job. You know, it, it might be an opportunity for them to fire you or to let you go, uh, to see that you are perhaps weak, you know, and, that, and it's like, you wouldn't want that, but nonetheless, like what you're saying that there needs to be a culture that is inviting for people to talk about that stuff mm -hmm. because we don't know what's going on and, and, in other people's lives, you know, unless we talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that there's a great way to be able to to place it like this, and and I think that that um, all of us um, kind of fall on, on on this also, where I don't want to sound ignorant. If I don't want to sound ignorant, it's easy to manage. I just don't say anything. I don't uh, want to sound incompetent then I don't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound intrusive. Then I don't offer any ideas. I don't want to sound negative. Then I don't challenge the status quo. Then I don't challenge yeah. anything that is occurring. Right. So it's so much more, uh, so much easier to manage those aspects of it simply because it's easier to just not do any, any of those. And yeah. Until it eventually boils over, you know, and then that's what, bur that's when you experience burnout. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I've burnt, I've burnt myself out many, 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 many times. And it, it finally got to a point where I just used that burnout time as, okay, this is your red flag warning sign to take some time, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's <laughs> not saying that that's the best approach people, but that's what I found myself doing was I would run myself down hard until I hit burnout. And then that was the big moment for me to say, okay, you know, what part of my life do I need to switch around here? I've been getting better at it just for probably the sense of just practicing prevention. You know, uh, for me, I'm a, I'm an early riser, but I don't have to be an early riser, you know, like I, I don't have to be at work until nine technically, but I get up between four and five just to have that time to myself. I hate feeling rushed. I hate feeling like I'm, you know, I'm late somewhere. Mm -hmm. So just to be mentally prevent that, I, I get up extra early, you know, it's not that hard to do, but to your point of like a subtle difference that I've made in my life, a very small, minute thing that really sets up my day for success. And I, and I feel good, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, that piece on, um, how we, we, we kind of learn how to bounce back, um, quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's something, it's a def, definitely a skill that we, we develop through, um, develop through, through, through life. And part of the conversation, I think here, um, in, in, I mean, we could definitely go on a, in a, um, tangent, uh, with, uh, with burnout itself, but it, it very relevant here with the, with the topic. And I'm going to say also that with, uh, helping professions, um, we do see uh, a higher risk of burnout and compassion fatigue than any other um, industry, particularly with the nonprofit sector. Um, I think that just a couple of days ago in, in, this is one of the projects I'm actually, uh, wanting to be able to, to get into, but, um, the statistic was somewhere around 77% of people that work uh, in the nonprofit sector believe that they should be placing themselves second to their client. And that is very relatable to, to me. I mean, myself being involved in the nonprofit sector for the past 15 years, that is exactly what I've always had in my mind. I, I, I have to place myself second in the um, greater good. Mm. Um, and I think that when I say it, it makes so much sense. But at the same time, when we're talking about burnout, when we're talking about the resources and the social capital that we are providing for people that are helping other people. Yeah, it's quite the opposite. Exactly. It's quite, quite the opposite. And 
there is something that comes with that too. And this is part of this uh, stage or this chapter in my life as well. When um, I decided to detach or separate uh, and full uh, go into my professional practice, I left my uh, non, non, non-profit um, job where I was rendering the services, right? Where I was already helping people, especially in those critical needs that we see throughout our community. And I'm going to say that leaving the nonprofit at this capacity, I still, of course, I'm a, a board member for the Erie County Minority Health Task Force, uh, participated with the, the community events with our local yeah. animal sanctuary. So I'm still very well embedded. And like I said, I also uh, looking into starting a project to support um, more particularly professionals in the nonprofit sector. But when we leave the nonprofit sector, I think that there is also accompanied with a sense of um, failing the mission or abandoning the mission or abandoning what I was doing and helping. And that is, that is devastating. Um, it really pushes your boundaries on what your values and belief systems are because am I really abandoning something that I've worked so hard to get into and the way that I've been able to help people Mm. Um, not being able to do so at that capacity did bring about a bit of those th- that notion. So for myself, it has been a little bit of that push. How can I be able to continue to embed myself in, 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 in that area? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, like maybe, maybe you're not in this headspace yet, you know, but I, like as a listener, I would look at it in this, or I hear it in the sense of you, you love it so much that you realize you had to leave it to move with your best foot forward on that mission. You know, I, I, I think it's, you know, and again, to each their own, some people, some people just work a nine to five job and that is, that's all that they want to put into it. This isn't for you. Like, like, but for the people that have a passion or a mission, when it comes to your, your, your career and, and, and what you're passionate about, that that is not done in just the job you know like you're gonna have to have lots of jobs hell i've had i think i'm on like somewhere between 30 and 40 jobs you know that i've had in mental health and and yeah each each and every one of them was was difficult to leave but i sort of got to a point to where i either outgrew it or i wasn't feeling that 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 challenge to better what i'm passionate about and that mission Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm literally starting a whole new job, um, currently and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a weird space to be in, you know, I, I feel very vulnerable with doing this, but at the same time, now I'm really excited about the opportunity to do it. It's, it's, it's re-energizing and that's what I'm always chasing. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely and entirely agree with you. There's a pursuit of, um, uh pursuit of passion and the ways that we want to do things that bring about also also joy. Um, and for myself, I think that that was also part of, uh, part of that shift um, into being able to find exactly that tune that spoke to me more directly. Mm. Um, but let me get a little bit here then with um, psychological safety and this um, overarching trend, right, that we're talking about how we feel safe on those environments and to have those conversations, that um, when I was diving into what could be the background behind this, I bumped into Amy Edmondson's um, research. So she comes from the academia side of uh, sort of things. And she was doing a study on how high-performing teams, what was the correlation between high-performing teams and errors? Coincidentally, what she find, uh, found out is that the high-performing teams had more errors, human errors. This is in the hospital setting too, mind, mind the conversation. Oh boy. <laughs> so, so what a touchy top, topic, right? And, mm-hmm. and I can even imagine for a researcher to have this type of fun finding of, well, what, what, is it, what does this even mean? Yeah. So when she started diving a lot more into this, what 
was starting to uncover was that by nature of having a space where people feel comfortable to challenge, where people feel comfortable to make an opinion, it brings about innovation. It brings about different ways of doing things, uh, better ways of doing them. Uh, maybe even going back to something that was done before. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It can just really bring about those conversations where people can feel more comfortable to bring about this topic. So I know, of course, we have a bit of that piece on how... Uh, us inter uh, we internalize um, some of those um, emotions that arise from um, the line of work that we are in, but also on the procedural or operational side of how um, teams perform. We also talk about all those nuisances that occurs um, in between either on the process um, or on the way that the work itself is is being done and how can we bring about that comfortable um, level. So one of the things that you were pointing out um, earlier, Michael, was do I do I feel do I feel safe to speak up? Do I feel do I feel safe to to challenge? Right? Do I feel do I feel safe to say something mm -hmm. and to and to and to open up? So the idea behind it then with psychological safety again, if seen, I want us to kind of see it first on the scope of um, how teams perform. But I still um, also invite to kind of have that open space where we can also think about how maybe some of this conversation can impact the way perhaps that you manage relationships at home um, or even on your day in and day out um, because it very well very well ties in at the end of the day I always think that the world spins with humans interacting with other humans and, and, and that is the bottom line we have to interact with other people um, so when we think about this then the definition is that psychological safety is the space where you are free to take risks, interpersonal risks, without the worry or without the thinking that you're going to be shamed for it. That you can raise uh, those ideas as creative or wild they might be about a situation itself at work, for example, um, or whatever the, 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 the case may, may be. So I wanted to try this in a way of maybe putting it a little bit into, into the, the context, um, because I feel that maybe kind of talking it um, at this level um, sometimes can, can be uh, lost in, in some of the wording, but I want to, uh, maybe if you would be willing also, um, Michael, maybe to, can like share uh, perhaps a, a story or a time where you worked with a team and that team accomplished and you're part of being part of that, of what was accomplished, if, if you um, would would uh, be willing to, to share. Yeah, I mean, so like one of, one of the, the jobs that I had in, in the past was doing applied behavioral analysis um, for a clinical hospital, let's just say that, primarily served um, children with autism and uh, they, they, you know, they had already sort of been through the public school system. They've, they've, they had been through the specialists and were really at a point in their lives to, to learn date, just basic daily living skills, you know? And it was interesting because the way that the, the hospital kind of pitched what they were doing to their employees was, you know, we're, we're kind of at a point where our focus is not to make the client better. It's to make the client more capable for someone else to help them, you know? So, I mean, we're doing like just teaching them how to, how to communicate, but, you know, in, in some form, um, potty training teenagers, you know, I was, I was doing that is trying to make their lives more independent so that way, the next person that would come and help them, it made their job a little bit more manageable. Mm. And it, it, it took a team, you know, sometimes like these, you know, the kids were so severely aggressive that it was like, like a three on one. So three staff members to one kid. However, though, you know, working, at, working with the team and sticking to this long, 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 long therapeutic intervention, applied behavioral analysis, 
you would just have those small moments of like complete validation and joy and bliss to to hear a nine-year-old say their first word mm -hmm. you know and um yeah i don't know if, it, if that's kind of what what you were talking about of working as a as, as a team and, and doing a really difficult job and now now that i'm kind of in the moment of like reflecting on that you're also right in the sense that like back then the you know the kid was first i would i would endure so much i mean dare i say trauma it, it, it definitely was traumatic because looking back on it like i had some really bad coping skills you know to get through those tough days but i never spoke about it you know i didn't want to seem like i couldn't handle this type of job mm -hmm. so i was just psychologically locked in you know into my own head and i mean i don't know if people I think at the time I thought that no one wanted to hear me complain about doing it or that really that they could handle it because it was, it was mentally very, very difficult, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael, for, um, for sharing um, that and how also personally um, impacted uh, you uh, directly through those those relationships and maybe um also tying it here uh with the conversation i'm i'm thinking of maybe some of the things that um we're working um also with uh with that team um and kind of thinking of maybe some of the behaviors that you would see from uh, some of your teammates what would you say or what kind of comes to mind that permitted for this uh programming to be successful in the way that you're relating to? Uh, I, I think that th the management definitely was aware of how fast the staff could become burnt out. Um, you know, it was a very, very high t turnover rate. I think, I think the expected turnover rate was th three months, you know? So every three months there'd be a new shipment of new employees you know and then they would inevitably everyone would become burnt out and or you know dare i say afraid for their own life um because i was hurt a lot you know i was i was hit i was bit i was kicked i was spit on um you know i physically and verbally um assaulted you know but the the management, I think, did a good job of sort of rotating us. So that way, you know, we, we would try to minimize that. Um, you know, they would do what others on the outside might see as silly play at work. You know, we would, we would get lots of breaks to go outside and, you know, food, you know. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, some of the things I'm, I'm, I'm hearing is that there there is an acknowledgement of the challenges that um, each of you were uh, facing, um, both mentally and physically, um, from from this experience, um, I'm also thinking perhaps um, you personally. What what maybe as we're uh, reflecting this, and we still have this image in your mind's eye, and thinking of some of the things that you would also be doing to kind of uplift or support or be there and show up for your teammates? What what sort of things kind of come to mind that you were doing? Uh, I I mean, the first one would, would probably be humor. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to seem like I'm saying you have to have a sick sense of humor, but like, you know, what's that saying? You know, you, you could either laugh at it or you can cry about it, you know? And, and we, so I, I think humor was a big one. And uh, I think just acknowledging and checking in with with my my coworkers you know like if someone did have a you know what i would consider to be a a really difficult traumatic experience to just look them in the face and say are you okay you know like do do you need anything right now just to acknowledge that mm. yeah the uh, great uh, great examples um, great examples and I think this ties in um, perfectly then here I, I did mention the name um, before uh, Timothy Clark um, Timothy Clark you can think of uh, this guy also big in 
psychological safety, but he's more of the guy that um, went in into, if you want to call it, the boots on the ground, the first, uh, the frontline employees, uh, mid man. I mean, you you name it. He, this guy was talking to to everyone to understand then what are those factors that permit, and maybe a little bit of what you are also sharing about um, the first and foremost uh, area that he talks about um, is that in order to be able to have psychological safety is the idea of inclusion. Now, when we talk about inclusion, I know there's a lot of conversation about DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I think that the best and easiest way to describe inclusion is whether or not you have the belief of the inherent value of people, period. We accept people simply because they are people. Mm -hmm. So that that would be that inclusion piece. Yeah, no, I like that because, you know, yeah, I, I think inclusion is, is a very, it's a very touchy word here currently, but people confuse it with what I see is, 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 is you know, the back door to segregation. You know, if, if you're trying to be inclusive and by doing that, you're trying to blanketly paint this picture of every, every race, every, you know, gender, every age, every color, you're doing the exact opposite. Like you're, you're accept inclusion means to me and same with diversity that you can appreciate all of it, all of it, the ugly, the despicable, the grossness of it and the beautiful, the precious, the uniqueness of it. Mm. That's diversity and that's inclusion. It's not this you know, coloring book of every possible type of person and boosting them all up to uh, the idea of, you know, equal outcome rather than equal opportunity. I'm a big fan of the second part of that equal opportunity. I'm a big fan of, but yeah, yeah, sorry. I can go on a tangent with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that is uh, uh, I think that is um, right and on the spot because you said um, uniqueness, um, and I think that that's also part of it uh, uh, too. Is that we acknowledge that everyone has the potential to? I think that we talked about the better self, right? So that everybody has that potential to become that person, and it's very unique to each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to accept that inclusivity in 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 that definition that we are portraying um, in this moment, then the second stage that we talk about is learner safety. If we have inclusion and we say um, that we value people because of their potential, then we are creating a space to have people be able to learn um, to people themselves be able to find the ways that they can do what they that they do, um, right? So we're opening up this space where people can ask questions. We're opening up this uh, space where people can feel comfortable to take risk, to make errors, and to correct them. If we're able to build on that learner safety, then we can uh, start moving into being able to. And I, I wrote this one down because it all it always escapes my mind. And I know it starts with a C because that's how I can see it in my mind. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the word always just throws me off. Um, and it is uh, contributor safety. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So now you can also add. So I already learned. I already know that. I can speak up because there's that inclusi uh, inclusivity. Mm -hmm. So now I can contribute. Yeah. Now I can put on the table and be as equal as everyone else putting onto this table. So I, of course, I, again, I want to kind of narrow it down into the uh, context of a, of a team and uh, working towards a common goal, which it might be a little bit different when we talk about um, uh, society in, 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 in general. But I want us to kind of just also keep that in mind, but um, contribution, being able to to add into it. And the, the last piece that he brings about is challenger safety. So if we have all those three as our baseline, then the last piece that we have is that we can challenge. 
we can say, hey, this is not the right way that we should be doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be speaking up when there's errors. I think that very relatable to the research that Amy Edmondson um, was bringing about as well. So there is this notion then that through these four steps of safety, then we can open up the space where people feel comfortable to be able to talk. Of course, I, I wanted us to also keep in mind, um, in the back of our minds, how this is also relatable in our day in and day out. Um, can I even thinking of this space, uh, Michael, that you've set up for people to come in and talk to you? Mm -hmm. There's inclusivity, there is learning opportunity, there's contribution that we're bringing onto the table, and there's a challenge that is expected to have about uh, an intellectual um, argument or uh, conversation rather than a social um, argument, and which is very different um, when we bring about um, this. So... There is a very cool uh, uh, quote um, from uh, Maja Angelo that she says, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you do, but people will not forget how you make them feel. And that is the baseline of psychological safety. Well, I love it, buddy. And, uh, Thank you so much for coming in and uh, hopefully you'll be open to coming back. Yeah, oh yes, I think that we still have so much to uh to uh to go over and definitely uh just brushing on the the surface um here. Um but I'm gonna think uh how can we 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 continue to show up in the the things that we do and continue to open up that that space if um maybe we narrow down to to today um I feel that we did cover a lot through different topics um from flow to presence, to bouncing back uh, from different uh, challenges or situations, to starting a new chapter. So I want to thank you, of course, uh, you for uh, having this space that is about psychological safety. And at the same time, for people that are listening in, what a wonderful way to expand um, your knowledge and build upon also your own ways of doing um, and going about maybe borrowing from some of these conversations that you've listened throughout. So thank you so much. Hold each other close, walking in the rain You were like a picture and not the frame You were like the air and not a plane by the way, at The Wellness Project, we have merchandise. That's right, all mental health awareness themed products. Uh, we've got artwork, we've got shirts, we've got hats, uh, we've got candles. We're gonna have uh, one for like anxiety awareness, depression awareness, wellness awareness, which is actually out right now. That's right, you can get your own wellness awareness candle. What does it smell like, right? Mm, you have to come in and check it out. But if you hit me up on uh, Facebook or you can email me and I can give you that information and thank you for your support. There's a million places I could go, but so you